Hello folks, let me know if the audio is okay. I've got some issues here. I had some internet issues to begin with, which I think I've now resolved. But I've got some really weird um, other issues. Uh, crikey, my hair's so long now. Please take us out of lockdown. Um, I can't quite work out what's going on here. This is very, very odd. I did a restart. Thanks, Laurie. Um, and howdy doody, by the way. So I'm connected to the open OCT, that's fine. Why can't I run cargo anymore? What on earth has happened? Uh, very strange. Cargo not found. Um, I've done something here. Hold on. Held your horses. I didn't know what it might be. And uh, let me just bring up Ubuntu uh, here. Let me have a look at my path. Uh, okay. Um, Oh, my path looks okay. It's got to be something like that, surely. Uh, wait a minute. Hold on. Um, let's have a look at my bash profile here in case I've messed with something. So I was playing around with that a little bit back. Yeah, I'm just going to Just gonna get rid of that actually. I don't trust that file at all. Um, let me just try this. Build me a sec, folks. A minor technical issue, hopefully. I know I changed this though, so it's a good chance that this is the problem. I certainly don't need that. Let me just exit. Let me run Ubuntu again. I think I did it. Cargo version. Would you add a mini Eve it? That was the problem, right? So let me just quit this um, terminal and run another terminal. Now I bet it works. That seems better. That's good. Um, oh, I need to quickly just test something. Uh, let me just check my circuit diagram. Bear with me just a few moments, folks, and we'll be back to normal business shortly. Oh, um, that's not the right one. Ah, oh, damn it. Um, I'll quit the 
the circuit. Um, boom, 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 boom. so ground is the one up at the end. Oh, no. Right, okay, normal service should be resumed. How is everyone? Good, I hope. Had a good week. I have tea. How are you doing, Laurie? Mm -hmm. Good cycling weather. Yeah, no, it wasn't quite as hot today as it was yesterday, which is cool. It was nice today. I still haven't serviced my bicycle, lorry. I need to do that. I might get a chance over the weekend. Um might limit what I do this week streaming wise so I probably won't do the Thursday and Friday stream this week um, <laughs> that's my plan um, I don't have anything particular planned for uh, tomorrow and Friday so really t today is just about finishing off where we were um, and then seeing what else we can do without starting anything big for the simple reason I don't want to get bogged down in anything big um, so I just need a few days off at the least quite frankly um, it's gone a bit mad recently um, what I do want to look at today so let's review where we were actually would be a good idea so um, the last stream was Friday, right? Um, so what we did, um, we got the uh, NMIGEN SPI slave working with SPI. Um, we managed to port the whole thing to RTIC the newer version 0.6 which was somewhat different from the other ones but we got there thank goodness and then we were playing playing around with the um, dual SPI I can't remember how much I did on the stream I know I hadn't had it all working on the stream but subsequent to that um, I mean the problem that I have we wrote the basic code which was let me just remind you it was this this was the uh, function that we're calling the new DSPI function rather than the old spy one okay so we were creating this transaction and then we were trying to run it and what we found was that the um, the default clock frequency for the um, STM32F7 uh, dual SPI clock was running a prescaler of one which is divide by two effectively um, given that the clock is operating at 216 megahertz that meant it was running at 108 megahertz so w when we ran this we didn't see anything so it's fairly obvious to me that that was likely to be um, 
a potential issue. Um, normally it's best to start, start at lower frequencies. And then I was looking into what we needed to change. So um, I checked out a version of the STM 32F7 HAL and um, had a look into how it was setting or if it was actually setting the prescaler at all. And it turns out it was just setting it, you know, on this divide by two. So in a local version over the weekend, I played around with that. I took it all the way down to about four megahertz and um, managed to get it. Um, first of all, I, 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 I actually hit a whole bunch of snags, most of which were my own problems and nothing to do with the code. Um, but at four megahertz, I could actually see it on my old... Um, logic analyzer which you know I couldn't make any sense at 108 megahertz so um, what I found there was a couple of issues one is one of the pins was wrong I'd set one of the function pins wrong it took me ages to work this out so when I'm setting the alternate functions for DD0 and DD1 when I actually looked at the data, one of them was actually changing, one of them wasn't. It turns out, I think one of them I'd set to AF8 rather than AF9 accidentally. Um, so that was my first issue. And then the pins that I had it going to, I also had connected to something I still had on the breadboard, which was pulling one pin up and then I was getting the pins mixed up and so yeah it was a bit of a palaver really um, but most of them were just you know my silly errors eventually when I could see what was going on I worked out what was wrong and um, managed to get it working um, so I had DSPI working um, with a 4 megahertz clock and that was using a local version of the STM32 F7 repo. But I really want to be able to use the, um, the default repo rather than a fork. I mean, I can fork it on my website if necessary. Um, so the next step was to be able to speed things up to see how fast we could actually run it. So the other thing that we needed to do, um, so I got the basic DSPI working, uh, changing the LEDs, and then I was going to do this, but I actually did this in the in-between period. I was going to do it today. Um, but I actually did this. I got the, um, if you remember last week, Laurie pointed me to um, an MMIGEN PLL example. Um, so I had to play around with that. I had to change a few things. I think that by default that was set up to work on the up 5k, which is slightly different. The way that the um, PLL is set up is different. Um, but eventually I managed to get that working. Um, so I increased some speed and it still seemed to work quite nicely. Um, so in the end I then switched back to using the default STM32 F7 HAL and tried running it at that default frequency that it runs at 108 megahertz and it does work but occasionally it um, it um, gets it wrong it suggests to me that there are there could be several issues with that but um, some of them could be routing issues, possibly, um, on the board. It could be that um, we're pushing the FPGA. So in order to, uh, to do that, I was running the PLL at between, you know, kind of 216 megahertz and 272 megahertz. 
which is that's right near the top end of what's possible in in this particular fpga so um i'd be pushing my luck quite frankly uh i found it probably operates best around 220 megahertz so it's over the nyquist sample rate which is which it needs to be obviously to work consistently but it still um still messes up occasionally um i just updated my logic analyzer as well so it'd be interesting to have a look this evening um because this is this logic analyzer is a bit faster i might be able to see what's going on possibly i don't know um it's slightly out of range still at that frequency um so that's where we are with that one so we'll have a look at that um then we can have a look at some of the other bits so laurie says been doing some work on non linux saxon stock what's the difference between the linux and non linux does it just not have things like mmus and stuff laurie is it always like a completely different build the bare bones one I don't know. I'm not um, not an expert on Saxon Sox, so I don't really know what's what. I should also have a look and see what if we've got some news items as well. Let's have a quick look if there's anything we need to cover. Um, yeah, let me turn the browser on. We should cover this. Just a few small things I've noticed. Um, Um, Timon School, or however you pronounce his name, um, I'll send you his uh, link actually. He's just announced his uh, crowdfunding for his um, uh, Raspberry Pi CM4 base, and it's kind of Arduino shaped, it's kind of cool, really. Uh, he's also the guy that's designing the case for Glasgow. He's very involved in that project. So look, you can see the compute module there on his on his board. Um, you can't see it on here, but on the bottom there's a M.2 adapter as well. And he's also made a um, RP2040 m.2 board that slots into it so it's kind of cool so this is really nice and that's now on crowdsource uh sorry crowd supply should i say um, i don't know diodes delight so if you're into raspberry pi this is a or if you're into the compute models, modules in particular, this is kind of cool. It has an ADC on it as well, which is nice. Um, if you look, yeah, look, you can see a picture on the back. Yeah. He did show one, actually. He did a... There we go. That's the uh, RP2040 that goes into the M2 slot. 
on the back of it, which is kind of cool. Nice. So you can have a Raspberry Pi that has a RP2040 attached. I'm not sure which lines he's using now. Does he say? Um, the M.2 card is compliant with the M.2 B key. It uses USB at the moment, but a future version might integrate PCIe PHY. It's mostly a demonstration. So it's basically, oh, excuse me, been a long day already today. Um, it's basically, um, he's just using it as a USB connection, effectively, and power. Very cool. Um, oh, yes, please support White Quark. Let me give you his um, Patreon address. This guy does so much in the open source hardware area everywhere you go you run across his code and stuff oh sorry her code or or um work and in fact she designed glasgow originally the original concept but do support her um that one. Is there anything else I wanted to cover here? Here, yeah, this is quite nice. <laughs> nice tips. Okie dokie. Um, what was I going to look at? I was going to look at. Uh, no, not the black ice. Mine are already. They're going to. I'm going to put them on the. Um, on the Tindy store this week. They're all cleaned and ready to go. Been through the ultrasonic bath. Um, Through the code, I think. So, yeah, these are all the bits and bobs that have been done. Some of it was done in a stream, some of it I did over the weekend, to be fair. Let me see if I can run this properly. Um, if I, what do I need to do to trigger this? I need to, I need to open Putty first. Then I need a terminal. And I need to just set up the serial. Make sure I can program the damn thing. Let's upload something to it. No, that works. Let me just try it again. Make sure it's working multiple times. That's good. 
Now, if I switch to, let me just try and run. I need to show you the uh, end margin part, don't I? So let's do a quick switch to that. And I need to update it on here because you're probably seeing a different one. Bear with me. Uh, Python, Python. Let me just swap windows here. I really wish it would automatically do this. There we go. So what I did was I added, before we had this, right? Spy led. And then I created another one called DSPI LED. Um, these bits look similar. However, now we're requesting DD0, DD1, DSCK, and DCS. So we're not, we're not, we're not connecting to the SPI pins. We're connecting to a separate set of pins on the black ice, which are pins 73, 74, 75, and 76 from memory. Not necessarily in that order. Um, and then I've written a slightly different um, handler for this. So the big difference is um, if you go and have a look here. Um, so there's the DSPI device. So if you look at the original SPI device, look at the way that we're shifting here. This is the key difference. We're shifting in one bit of data and then shifting one bit along, right? Obviously, when we're working with dual SPI, which is what we're doing here, we're doing something slightly different here. So we're inserting two bits of data and then shifting two bits when we're shifting into the register. And we're obviously doing uh, half the number of um, transactions or shifts, should I say, specifically. Okay. Um, anything else that's different on here? Direction is different. They're all in the same direction, effectively, because the um, FPGA in this case is acting as a slave. And all I'm doing is sending in a single data byte. Normally you'd be sending addresses, etc., and then the values. But for simplicity, uh, that's all we're doing. Okay. So if we run this now, haha, <laughs> we're going to have to exit because it won't remember, will it? And I do it again. So, oh dear. Hold on. Ah. Damn it. Uh. I hear a pussy cat wishing to traverse. Hello. Twinkles, what are you doing? Say hello. Come on. Oh, hello. Put some chicken out for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have something to eat. Mm -hmm. Take a little look. Come on. Or have you finished it? Or oh, there's still some left in your bowl, look. Or do you want to go out? You just want attention, don't you? Uh, so I should be able to run this now. Let me just check. 
actually. That's programming. That works. So the next thing is, right, let me see if I can bring this up. Let's see. Let me get the analyzer up, hold on. Let's have a look at the signal. Meow. Let's see if we can do a capture. Bear with me a sec. I think this cat meant for that. Can you go out? Yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to be looking at the signal. It's running at, um, so the PLL is running at 220, I think, at the moment. And the, um, the SPI clock is 108. So let me just do, let's just queue it up. Start. All right, let me just do it again. I think maybe I quit it too late. Okay. Is that it? All right, let me just um, add in spy here. My Just going to change this. Hold on. To the look. So that's definitely the clock. Channel one. This looks like data. So that looks like um. Interesting. Uh. Hold on a sec. Let's 
kind of weird. Are these all the same? I think maybe it's just too high for this to capture. Hold on. This wasn't the only piece of data, was it, I saw. What's going on here? No. I hope I'm looking at the right lines here. Wait a minute. Uh, 125 mega samples. Wow. I need to go up. Try 250. sample it again I think I sampled that too low for because I didn't realize um, start this new software is slightly different to what I'm used to as well it does something slightly different Well done. This looks very similar. Mm. Two hundred and fifty megahertz. Surely not. And it's 125 megahertz. Something I miss here. Let me just check my connections. Let me show sure they're right. I'll change this. Very odd looking signal. Just go up to full whack. If it makes any difference, probably overkill. Okay, this is looking more interesting actually. Yes, there we go. Right, yeah, my, my bad. Sampling too slowly. Hold on, let me just set up this um, analyzer. Um, So what do I think? I think channel one 
is actually the enable. I think the clock is on channel three. And then the data will be on zero and two. Now, remember, this is SPI only, this particular analyzer, which isn't massively helpful to us. But we can work with it for now. Uh, how do I get rid of that? It closes it close the down window, it's really annoying. Okay, let's just leave it there for a the moment. So, um, yeah, so that confuses it slightly because it can't work out the data um, because it's DSPI rather than SPI. I'm pretty sure that there isn't a DSPI in here. Oh, that's how you get rid of it. Uh, analyzers. What happens if I add a parallel one? The spy flash, but I don't think it's the latest version. That's the one that Scott's written actually. I think you need simple parallel for that. Uh, so what, it, what did I say? Zero is naught, and D one is three. Was that? Invalid setting for clock. Um, what did we say? Uh, three. Oh. So zero and two. And then clock would be channel three, right? And the enable, has it got an enable? Yeah, I think that kind of works, look. Um, it doesn't have a, does it not have an enable, damn it. Okay, so saying zero, 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 one, three. Um, is that right? No, maybe if I add. My flash to that. Um, it might not like zero. Address bytes need to be one to four. Oh, yeah, this is probably not going to help. Only data.
um, supported analyzers, async serial, spy ham, one more parallel. Not getting anything off there, is it? Oh, yeah, it's working. No, it's not. Zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. Yeah, it's not. It's just counting the lower bits. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be counting the upper bits. So it's seeing a reposition of zero, one, two, three. I mean, close, but no cigar, really. Um, but I think the data is actually right. It's just getting this decoding to work. The good thing is I can actually see it now um, because I upgraded I had um, a low bandwidth one before. I've now bought their Pro one, which are, they are very expensive. Um, but they are pretty good. The fact that it does 500 mega samples per second is kind of nice. <laughs> so I can actually look at, you know, decent signals like flash and, um, maybe hyper flash and things like that. I probably wouldn't be able to look at um, SD RAM unless you slowed it right down. I mean, I guess if you bring it down to about 100 megahertz, you can probably see it. So that looks good. So that's one digit. So that's, you can see there's a difference here. Um, so that's one. So this is the, oh, that's two actually. That's one. You can see that's the LSB and no larger one. And then the next one is one, sorry, two. And then that's a two and a one, effectively. And that is two, a one, and a one, etc. So it is counting up. Now it's gone back to zero. So it is getting slightly mixed up in the way it's calculating this, I think. But it looks good. Um, sometimes it doesn't always end up I, I know when it kind of works right the leds all end up on because i know where it should end up but sometimes not all of the leds end up on if i keep run, running this interesting uh is there any other options on here Hmm. So that's good news. It's really nice being to see decent frequencies on this damn thing. And, and these are also smaller than new ones. Mind you, it's probably because I bought a Pro 8. They're actually quite tiny little um, boxen comes in a big box like that big but it's only like that wide by that <laughs> so 
So, marvellous. We can see something going on. The signal looks good. I wonder what it looks like when it goes wrong. Let me see if I can catch it going wrong. That'd be good, wouldn't it? That went wrong. That ended with just the blue and the green LEDs on. He <laughs> wonder what I can see here. So what do we see? We might not see anything here because it may be a problem with the FPGA internally. So it's gone, you know, naught one two three naught one two. So yeah, it's actually ended on a two. So it hasn't gone to the three for some reason. So if we look at the one before. Okay. All right, just bear with me a sec, folks. You can have a look at that waveform. See if you can see what's wrong. I'm just being called by someone. Hold on. Gotta make sure it's not an emergency. Yeah, three down that hot water bottle, you see. In a room. Meow, meow, meow. Sorry, folks, just give me a sec. Just sorting my daughter out. She's done her ankle in. Not just now, earlier. Had a problem for a week or two.
Do, 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 do. Sorry about that, guys and girls. And folks. And focuses. My goodness. Anyone see anything? Any significance? I was just thinking, could it be? Hold on. No, that is going to free, actually, isn't it? If you look at the other one. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, it has gone up by one. Hmm. So the signal does actually look good according to the logic analyzer. Oh, wait a minute. Where's the edge here? Is that in the right place? Yeah, I think so. Now, also, the other thing I should warn you about, the signal I'm looking at here is not on the STM32 side. Um, what I'm doing is I'm passing, as well as MMIGEN processing the signal, it's passing the signal through onto a PMOD. And then I've got a PMOD extender, which I'm plugging the logic analyzer into. Um, so this is a replication from inside the FPGA of the signal it sees at its border, assuming it hasn't um, broken anything. I just thought I'd point that out so that you know what you're looking at. That signal looks good to me. So why isn't it ending up with them all on? The least significant bits are one and one. Um, so maybe it's just messing up. Maybe it's a logic messing up at that speed. When I looked at the analysis before, um, hmm. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I did go through this. I think I went through this on the stream. Let's just switch back for a second. Let me just get rid of the logic analyzer. Hold on so that you can see uh, turn it off for a sec so if we look at the build um, max frequency for clock I mean this isn't necessarily accurate so on this critical path, uh, so it's 
megahertz. Hmm. I presume that's up to date. What's the name of this? Test build top. Um, and just to show you, hold on. So the thing that you, I can show you where we've added the um, PLL here, look. Input frequency 16 megahertz. Frequency out 220 megahertz. And it succeeds in getting 220. Otherwise, it normally complains down here if it can't get the exact frequency. I'd normally feel a bit better about that being a bit higher. So, I mean, it should be capable of it, but these are timing estimates. They're not perfect. And um, looking at the signal, I think the signal looks fine. You know, we're looking at a signal that's been, that comes into the boundary of the FPGA IO that's taken through four buffers effectively or five buffers or six buffers one for each line straight to the p mod output which is where i'm measuring this from and that signal looks good to me so any problem this is this has got i think is more likely to be related to um the actual hdl or the synthesis of the HDL inside. But it's interesting how it works most of the time, and then every now and then doesn't quite get it right. But I'm trying to think what else it could be. Um, we are effectively looking at the end of the transmission. From the STM32, so it can't be anything to do with the synthesis setup. So what it does is it reprograms the FPGA, the ICE40 HX. After it's reprogrammed that, it actually waits a small amount of time. Then it does the send. In this case, it counts from zero to, I think it's zero to eight. ending with the um, least significant nibble all being high and the least significant nibble is what's driving the LEDs so they should all be on right so why is it getting this wrong maybe it's the delay between these edges and the um, the edge of the select maybe that timing is you know a bit difficult i mean what is the difference between those two things i think i can put a marker on uh timing markers here we go add marker pair what do we say Hmm. So the last clock in and six nanoseconds between the last clocked data point 
and the uh, CS disable. That's not very long. Because the other thing we're doing in the logic is we we are resampling the um, the CS pins. We're, we're resampling all the pins basically, so we're shifting them in to two bits effectively for each one to resample them at the clock rate. And in this case, the clock rate is two hundred and twenty megahertz. That's the, that's what the PLL is generating for the clock. Now, 220 megahertz, the time between is hold on, 6, 4.5, just over 4.5 nanoseconds between each clock cycle. So it's pretty tight stuff. Could it be missing it? Hmm, not sure. I mean, I can look at that a bit further. I'd love to work out exactly what's going on, simply because um, it'd be nice to use a default clock frequency, and the signal itself does actually look good. You know, I expected to see maybe an issue with the signal. And I'm not really seeing that. So, um, sorry, I'm not showing you guys. There, I put the marker between the last clock and the CS going back up high, and it's six nanoseconds. And the clock cycle is every four and a half nanoseconds, so it doesn't have long. Because it resamples all these lines as it's doing it. So maybe occasionally it misses. Because that signal looks good. So it's not like the signal itself seems to have dropped out anywhere. The signal looks healthy. More likely it's it's the um the HDL that's been designed in MMIGEN, which is just thrown together anyhow, quite frankly. It was never done for any high speed stuff. Could be improved significantly. So maybe I just need to work on that at some point. I can probably fix it. But at least now with the new logic analyzer, I can see what's going on, which is good. And the signal looks good. So I'm I'm kinda happy that's working. We need to do a proper implementation for the SPI anyhow. Sorry, the DSPI. Because we need to do the addressing and everything else at some point. Any questions on this by the way, guys? So I'm here finishing my tea. I need some more water in the run in a minute. Oh, Mikey. It won't be a long one this evening, folks. It's been up since the crack of dawn this morning. No questions? Oh, that's good. Um, so I'm happy with what it's outputting. The signal integrity looks good in terms of 
doesn't look like there's any errors being generated on the PCB. I mean, if I looked under the scope, I might see something else. But if the logic analyzer is interpreting it correctly, then it's a very good sign. And it seems to be. So, um, hmm. maybe there's something odd about this because it doesn't go. No, I think the signal looks fine. Can't see anything wrong with that at all. It's gonna be my HDL. <sighs> um, what I need to start thinking about is what we do next. I'm not going to do it tonight, by the way, but we need to think about what we're doing next <coughs> on this. Um, on the, um, here's a question for you guys. On the automation board, like the little robot board, I wanted to put Bluetooth on. And the reason I'm thinking Bluetooth here is fundamentally... Um, to provide telemetry. Um, I don't think we need Wi-Fi. What do you think? Is my thinking wrong here? Can you think of us benefiting from having Wi-Fi as well as, or instead of, Bluetooth? I mean, it needs a wireless connection, right? Well, if we want telemetry, that is. Uh, BLE, I think. I was thinking of using the um, NRA, sorry, NRF 52 uh, 8XX. I'm not sure which one yet. I've got the dev kits to start playing around with that. I've got the um, DDK or whatever they call it for the. Uh, 52840 and I've also got a dongle um, I think it's got the same chip as well yeah 52840 and that can plug straight into the um, laptop that's kind of cool um, so that was the family I was thinking of using parts are really difficult to get hold of at the moment by the way Small numbers, you're right, but um, quantities. Because I was looking at the quantities for these Nordics, and they, they seem to be in relatively short supply as well. It's not just STMs and stuff. Luckily, I've got all the STMs I need. I bought a whole crap load. Um, um, when did I buy? I bought several lots last year. I've got this one, for example. This is what I'm going to use for the... Um, Is my plan to use for the uh, if you can read that here if you can read it hold on so I've got 1300 of those um, those are um, STM 32 uh, L four three threes, which is what I want to use on the um, automation robotics board. Um, I like the uh, L four three three series. Uh, it's also low power as well, which is kind of cool. I wanted low power if possible. Lori so says I'm happy with BLE for robotics. Yeah, it's a lot. It uses a lot less juice than Wi-Fi. The trouble is with Wi-Fi, you end up pissing away lots of um, battery life. 
when it's just sitting there if it's communicating the power consumption is quite high on these wi-fi chips whereas the bluetooth stuff is very modest it's a very low power signal in comparison um so um probably what i'm going to go for uh, let me show you something actually this is quite amusing i've got enough memory running hope i don't run out might start to um, hear the fan going somewhat it's already going anyhow um oh no i don't want that uh hold on one of the ones i was looking at this is kind of cool oh hope it remembers my last project Yeah, cool. Let me just turn this on. Hold on. Uh, where has it gone? PCB layout. Oh, it's picking up the wrong bloody. Window. Hold on, let me tell it which window. So um, you can see roughly the layout of um, the board in, in this area over here um, but the amusing thing is um, one of the options I've got is the uh, um, the NRF 52805 uh, and this one can you see it <laughs> it's a wafer scale package it's absolutely tiny but you can do it on a two-layer board it's exceptionally clever the way that they've chosen the pinouts um, you can actually break out the lines um, on a two-layer board you don't need any more than two layers it's very very cleverly designed so i was having a play around with that however it may put the ball cost up slightly because the distance between the lines still has to be pretty high res so you can't use that with your normal process but um yeah look how tiny that is so that's the uh, nrf 52805 um but i can't actually get any of these strangely uh they seem to be out of stock so i'm more likely to use something like this which is the um like an 820 use that out right hold on which is a QFN. I mean, this all needs juggling about. So this will actually be a small card, like an SOM. But that's just, I thought it was hilarious how small that was. <laughs> Very cool. So this little SOM here for the robotic automation board will be like, um, what is it? Uh, it's about 32 by 40 mil. Very small. Um, you think ice core was 50 by 50, right? So that's considerably smaller. And that has the... Uh, up 5k the stm 32 l 433 and um the bluetooth chip um got a flash chip on there as well that's a connector for the debugging we've got a usb c uh, an rgb led for the status 
small button for entering DFU mode if we need. Um, potentially another LED for the FPGA, but that, that's not. Still trying to work out which one to use. Still working out the exact pinouts that that passes through. This is a 50 pin connector, so it's like having half a um, half an ice core effectively in terms of the IOs, but it's actually a bit more than half because that whole thing's full and it's only there's only three voltage rails there. So you've actually got quite a few signals. Oh, I'm being pestered again. Bear with me. <laughs> so, yes, um, I'm hoping if I get a few minutes to lay this out over Easter. I can get these ordered. I really want to order these and have a play around. Be kind of cool. Looking forward to that. Um, yeah, thought I'd just show you that, guys. The only other thing I thought I might add on here, but I'm trying to work out whether I've got enough IOs, is um, is the possibility of adding the spy flash. Um, don't know what you think about that guy, guys and girls. What do you think? Would that be useful for anything? Having a spy, um, spy RAM, sorry, not spy flash, spy RAM on the FPGA. If I have a spare pin or two to do it, I might do it as a board, as an add on board, actually like this so i was thinking maybe i'll do a board that has like an sd connector on and a um and a flash uh, not a flash uh a spy ram then it doesn't impose cost on the original one for people that don't need it um what's Laurie saying i tried all the projects from this book a few years ago. Um, let's have a look. Bring the bells are up. <clears throat> Hold on. Let me just turn the um, browser on so you can see. Make Bluetooth LE projects with Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and smartphones. Hmm. So, do you recommend this book? So, it's from the Make House, so it's an O'Reilly, presumably. Interesting. Does it have a C inside? Paperback. Is there a Kindle version? Seal formats and editions. Oh, there isn't a Kindle version. It's getting a bit old, but the projects were interesting. I remember reading a Bluetooth LE book that someone gave me for Christmas, and I read it in a couple of days. It was all about low... This was years ago, and I've probably forgotten every single thing in it. Um, it was when Bluetooth was really hot. Alistair Allen, Don Coleman, Sandy Mystery. Yeah. yeah, my primary goal for the um, 
Bluetooth is really for telemetry more than anything. But these chips do support, they don't just support, um, they're very interesting actually, let me just show you. So that little baby one I was showing you is this one here, right? But in, inside that, you actually, it's actually quite generous. It's, um, I know they're saying they're Cortex M4s, but they don't have a coprocessor unit. They don't have a FPU, these ones. Only the bigger brothers do. And I'll come to those in a minute. But um, yeah, it runs at 64 megahertz. So it's got some processing itself. So you effectively, this design, if you've got the Bluetooth on there, you've effectively got two cores, which is kind of nice. One to handle your comms um, and the other to handle the real-time real stuff with the FPGA, which is nice. Um, so on here, I mean, this one's got 100, even this little baby one's got 192 kilobytes of flash. 24 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, it can do two or one megabit per second. I don't know how well the two megabit per second will work. I think they do long range as well. Um, it's got a 12 bit ADC. The ADCs are very low frequency affairs, so you can't use them to do like motor stuff, unfortunately. It's got UART and SPI. So all I do is I connect the UART and the SPI to the um, um, STM32. So I've got direct comms. Um, so the other one I was looking at possibly is the 52H11 as well. That's quite good. So that's just that's very similar to the um, this one. It's just in a bigger package, really. If I have trouble with the package. But look at the other things that some of these can do. What is really interesting with these is it's got Bluetooth Low Energy, right? But it's also got this um, long range thing, which is interesting. Because these are like uh, version 5.2, Bluetooth 5.2. But it's also got thread, which I don't know anything about. And it talks about this thing called Bluetooth direction finding, which sounds really interesting. So it can do some kind of triangulation, which might be useful from a robotic point of view. Uh, Laurie's saying, I think Alistair Allen worked on the Pico. Yeah, right, cool. Um, so the 52811 is one possibility. You can actually, this is a wacky thing I thought of, right? Um, so if you look at something like the 52820, I think going up to the 2840 and 52833s are overkill, right? Even though they do have the extra floating point unit, you don't really need it on there. Because we've already got that on the L433, right? And they get quite spenny in terms of the price. Um, but even something like the uh, 52820 here, you've got up to 256 kilobytes of flash. Which, which makes me think, well, you could possibly run MicroPython on here if you wanted to, as a possibility. I'm not saying that I necessarily do that, because you can actually program these with Rust as well, apparently. Um, it also supports Zigbee and Bluetooth Mesh. But uh, it has USB 2 on this as well. So here's the wacky thing, because if you were to look at um, the USB-C connector, you've got actually the USB-C connector has two USB inputs. Um, and what you do is you normally wire these so that if you put the cable in one way or the other way, it's the same. But what you can actually do is create this um, Jekyll and Hyde USB cable whereby I could connect the USB of the NRF to one of the pairs and then the L433 to the other pair. So depending which way in you put the um, 
USB cable. You could talk to either devices. And I thought that'd be quite funky from a development point of view. I don't think it would necessarily be a good idea to do a big product on because it might confuse people. I just thought it was a really interesting idea. So with the same connector and a single cable, you could either connect to one or the other, depending what you were programming. I mean, there's a programming header anyhow, so I can program them both from the header. But I just thought that'd be kind of um, quite a funky thing where you turn the cable around. <laughs> Particularly if you had like, you know, Michael Python on one and, you know, Rust on the other. Um, Laurie says, I think it was the NRF. 51822 that I used. Yeah, that's the previous generation, presumably. But anyhow, these are fairly capable. Um, but we'd effectively be using it most of the time for telemetry, which really just means it's, it's just like a wireless serial. Effectively, that's the easiest way to do it. I mean, you can actually. What uh, Scott was talking about um, was doing a USB less um, Bluetooth support for my for Circuit Python, which would be kind of cool. So in that case, you could use your Bluetooth as the comms, but you could also use it to share files. So that's. Um, an interesting idea that's probably not as efficient to do it that way but you you've got a number of options for bluetooth especially with 5.2 but i think it'd be interesting because i haven't really done any bluetooth stuff but it's going to be fun anyhow um but i do need to work out what i can actually get hold of for these because they seem to be in rather short supply for a lot of the models Hmm. so that's going to be a bit of fun and there is some good rust support as well so if you go and have a look on nrf rust at github you've got all these sub supporting for the different chips etc for the mdks I'm not sure how far the Bluetooth support goes, but yeah, you get an idea anyhow. So what's in the table of contents of that book, Laurie? They don't have one on Amazon to show. They only have the paperback version. It's only £16.35. It's not exactly an expensive book, is it? Probably add that to my basket. I wonder if there's an updated version. When was this? Oh, 2015. Blimey. Probably going to be a bit out of date. I wonder if there's anything else. Bluetooth. This one in books. Uh, getting started with Bluetooth Low Energy. I think that's the book I read a few years ago, which I've got kicking around somewhere. Maybe out of date now, though. So you got the Make book again. Hmm. Intel Edison, I don't think so. Developer's Handbook. When was this done? Well, oh, it's even older. Crikey. 
this was the one that I read originally. See, that's 2014. Crikey, is it that long ago? Intro to Bluetooth Energy. That's 27th of August 2018. It's a bit newer. An introduction to Bluetooth Mesh, look. What's Laurie saying here? It's getting a bit old, but the projects were interesting. And it taught me about BLE. Um, I think it was the, yeah, I saw that. Um, it controlled a drone. Most projects had phone control. Had a NeoPixel lamp. BLE beacons, a smart lock, a smart light switch, and a weather station. Telemetry, mind you, the telemetry should be fairly straightforward, shouldn't it? It's just like serial mode, dual mode. Yeah, I'm not going to go through all of that at the moment. That looks quite interesting. So that talks about the standard rather than any projects. Interesting. Yeah, the Kindle edition is only eight quid. I'm going to add that to the basket anyhow, because it might be useful to read. I don't actually want to buy that yet. I want to check see if there's any more first. Let me just, if I add that to my basket, then I'll remember. What else does it recommend? IoT. Oh, I use the packet stuff sometimes as well. Projects. Come on, I just want to see the table of contents. Mm, why is it so slow? Oh, here we go. What is Bluetooth Low Energy? Setting up. Right, Android applications, right? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Introduction to Raspberry Pi. Introduction to GitHub. Um, Introduction to Beacons. Yeah, they're really talking about hacking stuff here, really, aren't they? <laughs> Hack your Philips, Philips Sonic toothbrush, Sonic Air toothbrush. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to hack my toothbrush. Not that I have a Bluetooth one, anyhow. Oh, I hear a pussycat at the door again. Cross, what you doing? You come for some more supper. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, 
yeah, I'll have to have a look around and see what's available. Bluetooth tutorial. Twenty nineteen. Yeah. Wow, it covers all the different variants and some Zigbee stuff. Yeah, I shall have to have a look through this stuff. I'm going to put that in my basket as well, just so I remember. This might be worth putting in my basket. That's significantly reduced. I don't know if it's relevant though with another chipset. This is really slow for some reason. Right. Enough of that. Anyhow, um, was there anything else we needed to cover? Um, do that. So, um, oh yeah, I discovered, I found the robotic arm that uh, I was trying to tell, um, <laughs> this is really funny, the robotic arms I was talking about from China, but these guys also do bionic cats, <laughs> Mars cat. There's a Mars cat twinkle. You got competition. Look, look, Mars cats. You're not impressed, are you? You're not impressed. I'll let you out. Hold on. Do we get back? Is that what you want? Do you want to be replaced by a bionic cat? <laughs> Yeah, look how much it is. 690 quid. <laughs> Why is it didn't have a video of it? But there you go. Um, yeah, so I've shown and shared everything we need to talk about today, unless you've got stuff that you want to bring up. Um, as I said, I don't want to do a lot tonight because I've got to, I'm going to take a few days off over Easter. Black eye, Semex. Did I cover that yet? Um, hmm. I think I showed you the. Uh, yeah, there's lots of quite a bit of support for the uh, NRF stuff in Rust as well, so you can actually use Rust with it, which I think would be kind of cool. And I think they've used it at um, knurling as well, which is another rust thing. Right, uh, so let's get rid of that. Uh, if I just turn off the browser, actually, I'll just show you quickly about the, um, the USB thing. That's interesting. Turn that off. You'll see what I mean if I show you the... Um, schematic. Yeah. If you look at the USB,
on here you've got two effectively two USB connectors which you normally cross over so your cable works either way around so I could actually separate these out I just think it'd be kind of funky I wouldn't do it for like you know if I was making lots of these like a black eyes four or some um black eyes five or something I wouldn't do it but um for the robo board it might be kind of handy for an experimental type board certainly to start with It'd be kind of convenient to be able to program either over usb if i was using one of the usb supporting uh, bluetooth chips right so if there's nothing else guys i'm gonna uh scoot off early because i've got a bunch of stuff i've got to do um i will be on discord over the next week anyhow on and off if you've got any questions but we need to think carefully about what we're going to do probably next week as well um do we maybe do a bit of hardware rather than software next week switch back to a bit of hardware i mean if i've got this stuff rooted by then we could maybe talk about that a little bit um or if there's something else that you want me to talk about next week you know badge me down on discord or something let me know I also uploaded the last three Black Crab um, recordings as well because I forgot to do that over the weekend. Um, so they're there online if you missed any of those, but they are quite slow, obviously. Right, so if there's nothing more, guys, I'm going to call it an evening. Um, slope off early and um, I've got some bits and pieces tomorrow I've got to finish and then I'm going to take it a bit easier over Easter so you folks also have a good Easter and I'll probably see you just after Easter uh, next Wednesday if I don't see you before down on the um, either on the forum or on discord um, and then later on when we come back we'll have a look at some hardware I think great see you soon folks